Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We are back once again, and we got some new faces tonight. Should be an exciting episode, some good topics as well. Um, so let's just jump into it. Uh, we're joined, as always, from Brody Smith. Brody is here. Yeah, man of the people here. Last episode was pretty solid. Um, top comments. Obviously, we got our uh, class. I think it, it, I don't know if this is the same guy or people are just taking turns, but commenting every week until Yuli's on the show. With 60 thumbs up. This is week 11. Uh, we also have Dustin in the top comment category, which I think is anti man of the people taking over one of the top comments. Uh, and then Rusty Strings. I feel like Hunter and Trevor are the only two people that care about player of the year. I don't hear anybody else talking about it, especially not in July. Hmm. Shot, well, to that, fired. I would respond Shot Have fired. you ever tried to come up with new topics in disc golf every week? And hey, that would be... you, you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. If the media doesn't talk about it, who's going to talk about That's it? That's right. We're, we're just doing, we're doing the job that, you know, nobody else wants to step up and do it. Somebody has to, um, Hunter's here as well. Computer back on just in time. Kind of. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> she holds on. Just had something random pop up. Looks like it was trying to launch Dropbox. So we'll nice. see if it crashes. Yeah. Launching Dropbox. That sounds like I could be detrimental to your machine could there. Be. You never know. Um, and then we got two new faces tonight. We got Mike joining us, Mike. How's it going? Good to be here. I'm super excited, grateful to be here. I am a little conflicted on being on the day after college football came out. I'm not as prepared as I probably want to be, so yeah. balancing that. But <laughs> also, I do want to point out, if Brody really is the man of the people and all the people are asking for Yuli, where's he at? Just saying. It's a good point. It's a good Great point. It's a terrible point. Cahoots. I'm not in control. <laughs> I'm not in control of another man. I'm a man of the people. Yuli can do whatever <laughs> he wants. Wow. Spin zone. wow. Spin zone. Spin zone. Um, no, I'm, that makes sense, Mike. I spent quite a few hours uh, recruiting virtual high schoolers last night, and that sounded like a criminal statement, but it was NCAA football. Um, Ross is also <laughs> joining us tonight. New face as well. Ross, how are we doing? Excited to be here. Excited to chop it up with the boys and talk about some disc golf. All right. Awesome. Which should be great. Uh, have some new faces on the show. Always a good time. Um, one last thing to mention, if you notice, wow, the show seems a little more stationary tonight. The shot's not changing up, but it's because Silas is on vacation. Silas isn't here. He's taking a much needed uh, and deserved break. So we're going to be operating. Uh, we got no producer tonight. It's just me. Just the fact me, that, that the, the whole place over there is not on fire just is, is astonishing to me. Listen, so. I, I literally, I did one of those, the good old fashioned, like, okay, Salas, explain this to me. And then I just sat behind him with my phone and recorded them for like five minutes. So yeah. I could just go back through it because I that needed to. OBS had me in a corkscrew earlier, um, but we're good to go. Hopefully, if you're watching this right now, we figured it out. Let's get into our first topic, though, without any further delay. Um and let's talk a little bit about Ricky Wysocki. So Ricky Wysocki has started to catch fire at arguably the most important time of the season as we approach two majors. How do you feel about his chances at breaking the major slump this year? And do you feel like his window is starting to close at all? Or is that further down the road? What are your thoughts on that, Brody? Uh, I mean, the first thing is like, I thought, you know, this podcast here, I thought we just said Ricky was old and like old guys can't play. What happened to that? That was that was only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, surprising how weird when I said, you know, guys, Ricky isn't gotten hasn't gotten worse. It's just everyone around has gotten a lot better. Uh, seems like that's maybe more of the case here. Uh, mathematically, if we're actually like doing like how many more chances does he does he have? I put him at like thirty more majors. I think he's got realistically about eight years or so in that range, seven to eight years of being able to play four majors. And who knows, maybe they'll start making five majors a year. So I think he still has a quite a lot of opportunities there. And I went back and looked at how he performed in the past couple of majors. He finished third at champions cup, but he was seven shots off the lead after round one last year. He finished 11th at USDGC eight shots off the lead after round one. He finished 12th at worlds, seven shots back after round one he finished six at european open six shots back after round one so it's one of those things like if he just gets off to a good start and we saw it this weekend if the dude's in the lead and he's and he's feeling it it's very hard to uh, catch him so i would say if you're betting wait until you see what happens after round one if he's six seven shots back vote for a top or bet a top 10 don't bet for the win yeah, we, I mean, if there, we've learned anything this season, it's it's hard to play from behind these days and I, maybe getting the yips round one. Uh, Hunter, what do you think? No, it's it's interesting 
thought here, right? That we're seven years in already to this Ricky major drought. And what's even more interesting is that I was looking back on grip locked at the major he's won. And the only major that still exists right now that he's won is worlds. And mm-hmm. if we look at like the European open locked in course, obviously they're adding a second course this year that could play in Ricky's favor. USDGC locked in course. He hasn't won at either of those. Um, now, could he have won a world when it was a world tour? Maybe I didn't look at that. I'm looking specifically at majors champions cup. He hasn't won that event. Not a locked in course should be different topic, but I think that that might be a storyline to follow of like worlds is probably his best bet. Cause I do think that Ricky is going to play the best when the courses line up. If you look at the world championships, he did win. One was literally in his home, like his backyard, more or less. Not really, but he was sponsored by Trilogy. It was at Emporia. It was like a home tournament. Um, and the other one at Fort Gordon was a little bit of a, a interesting year. But the when the courses line up with Rick is when it seems to go well. And statistically, the courses of the majors that are left have never lined up with him before. So Worlds is his best bet. With that being said, I like him at New London. I think his game could really work well there. And I do mm-hmm. like him at Ivy. And so as he's peaking, European Open's hard to know because we don't know fully what that other course is going to play like. So it could play really well. It's just historically he hasn't won this event. So I don't mind him at Worlds. I don't like him at USDGC or European Open. Okay, okay. Um, Seeing a chance at Worlds. Mike, are you feeling a similar way about Rick this year? Let me set the stage, if I may. So Tom Brady made a 25-point comeback. Patriots. Ron was on the Cavs. Annan Burr was 11 years old. That's the last time Ricky won a major. And to be honest, I don't see one happening anytime soon. This narrative of getting hot at the right time, I'm not buying it because every single year he has one or two wins about at this point, and it just hasn't correlated. Ricky's very lucky that he is such a likable figure in the disc golf world and that disc golf pundits are relatively generous to him because this is a huge flag, red flag on his on his career. I mean, I really compare him a lot to like a Rory McIlroy in golf. He hasn't won. Rory hasn't won in 10 years a major. And during that time, he's been number one, number two in the world during that time for a big span of it, similar to Ricky. And it's clear that Rory just folds under the pressure. And the weird thing about Ricky is when he was winning his majors, he was doing it arguably against the hardest person to beat, Prime Paul. And the field is harder now, but he's made it clear he can win in this field. He's done it a bunch. He's done it almost everywhere, except majors. And at some point, we can't say it's a coincidence. Brody mentioned seven or eight years left of majors. We've already seen seven or eight years of, of no win. So it'd be crazy to say he's not going to win another major. His physical window is not nearly passed. That's silly to say. And it'd be crazy to suggest he's not going to win again. But they've also been saying that about Rory for 10 years. And here we still are. Here we still are. There, there is something about that funk when you're in it. And that's a, it's a good comparison, honestly. Um it can be tough to dig yourself out. I, I definitely agree with that. Ross, wrap it up for us. What do you think about Ricky? Where are you siding on this one? I will say I understand people who complain going last because everyone has, uh, you know, they just shared <laughs> some points that that I wanted to bring up. But you know, Brody or um, Brody, you mentioned his his recent finishes in the last ten majors. His average average place is seventh. That's just not good enough for a top five player. I don't believe he's going to win a major until I see it. You know, every single major, I'm going to go in and say, I don't think he can do it. I think Ricky's kind of like the Dallas Cowboys. Sorry, sorry, Brody, if that hits too close to home. Fan- Dallas Cowboys, fantastic in the regular season, beat up when, you know, one o'clock games when no one's watching, but the second the lights are the brightest, they collapse. Ricky just has not been able to do it over the last seven years. And until uh, he is able to do it, then I'll believe it. Um, you know, if, if for this year, if we're talking strictly just about this year, if it was, if I, if I had a line in front of me of half a major, I would hammer the under, mm. um, you know, with, with Hunter, what you said about USDGC, it seems like a course that whether it's the OB and his just kind of get and hope, uh, mentality, he just does not line up well there. I don't know how well that's going to play at new London either with how punishing that course can be. Um, and with European open, I just haven't seen it. He just hasn't been, uh, you know, that player. Um, it seems like he kind of has his style of courses, which are not the most punishing courses, like the preserve where you kind of can just spray it. You hope to get close to the basket and make your putt. So I'll believe it when I see it, but until then, I'm not going to believe he can do it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I, go ahead. 
Uh, this is to Mike, actually. Uh, you comped Ricky with Rory. I think that's actually not a great comp at all because Rory's been in contention at multiple majors and has collapsed the final day. Ricky, you look at it, the past couple of years, he's really only been in contention in one major, and that was Champions Cup last year where he took se second and he was only one back after round one. Uh, the only other one that comes is USDGC last year or in 2022, excuse me, uh, where he was the lead in round one and round two. He's a Tommy Fleetwood. He's a guy that shoots himself <laughs> out of the tournament in round one. And now the pressure's all off. No one thinks he can win. I mean, some of these tournaments, I, I was looking, I was beating Ricky in a lot of these majors in the first round. What does that have to say to all these people say that I'm trash. I'm beating this guy. <laughs> so, so that just kind of shows you like he, to me, he's like a Tommy Fleetwood he needs to figure out how to get going in round one and not be out of it. And then I mean, we can see what happens. But you can't call him really a choke artist because he's not even showing up. Like he's 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 not even getting to the dinner part. He's choking I would, in round one. <laughs> I would I would agree with that to a point, but I do think disc golf and golf, the way scoring works is a bit different where you have to get out to fast starts. In golf, you don't. You really don't. And – where Rory and I get what you're saying and where Rory might be putting all that pressure on at the end. It seems like Ricky's doing it at the beginning of the event where then it's too late. But I think the sentiment of just being on top for so long and nothing to show for it and the tournaments that we all care about the most when he's trying to chase Paul, he's trying to chase the goats. I uh, I think it, it still is a, is a good comparison in the sense that like he just showing up when it matters i think yeah i think big picture it makes sense you know you, you de there's definitely a comparison there but yeah it's i actually haven't looked close enough to see that round those round ones are just killing him like that i mean i think that he's, really he's literally has only had in the last eight majors he's only had uh he's only been within six shots of the lead after round one in two majors out of that's the last crazy eight. that's one really thing crazy. that would be interesting for his career wise is if you go back 2016 usdgc i believe is the year the big germ one mm -hmm. and that was the year they ended it after round three and it was mm. a, a typical rick situation where he Never was storming know. back but he was chasing down germ and yeah. i think he had him to only a handful of strokes with one full round might of play been, that yeah, might have been two or three shots yeah it was not much so everyone going into it as much as they said you know germ got a major that you know even germ has said he wanted to play that final day because he doesn't want that blemish it's also like a lot of people were, back then were saying Ricky was stolen. Major was stolen from Ricky because like it really seemed it. And 2017 Worlds when he won, I believe that was the one at Fort Gordon. Um, Paul was on uh, unbelievable pace from the chase oh, yeah. cart through eight or nine holes. I was walking with Paul and he had cut it to like a stroke or two. Like it was unbelievable what he was doing. And then a rain delay happened. And it just paused momentum. And then when play resumed, I think Paul went par, Ricky went birdie, and then Ricky cruised in from there. But that's another thing where weather kind of helped him the other way. But you can look at it either way. If the chips fall his way and he wins USDGC, has that monkey off his back in 2016, does that allow him to play freer? And he's won that tournament, you know, another time or two because that's the one I think that haunts him the most. And chips flipped. If the weather doesn't go his way, in 2017 does paul chase him down win that worlds and then we're at an eight-year drought a lot of what ifs it's certainly um that's him and calvin golf. him and, yeah him and calvin have definitely become the most entertaining watches at, at these majors to see if they can get the first or break out of the slump um let's move on to our next topic i want to talk uh we have a few questions about the crow Cole open um because i think it was just a fascinating event to spectate um whether you were there or if most of us were watching online um I'm so let the dogs Cole, in real quick Okay, Thank you, <laughs> you can let the dogs in. Sorry, you don't go till last. Uh, the Crocal Open took place at the number one course in the world and was yet another shining example of the type of courses European countries have been able to create. Why do you think the European countries are able to pull off these venues when the top U.S. courses typically fail to meet the same standard of care and beauty? Hunter. This is a, a really good question that, you know, kind of racked my brain or wrecked my brain for a little bit. But I think what it comes down to, and it's going to be similar to my thought process on the next one, is the percentage of players to population, if that makes sense. Where disc golf by numbers is going to be smaller, but by percentages is bigger over there. So I think it's easier to 
get access to the property, easier to convince, you know, people who maintain properties, yada, 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 about disc golf because you don't have to start with, have you ever heard of disc golf? It's like Frisbee golf, you know, like it's like golf, but we don't have to start with that conversation. It's already taken seriously because of the percentage of people that play. So it's already on a bigger scale because it's a smaller country that doesn't have the big five to deal with, right? They don't have the NBA, the MLB, yada, yada, yada. So disc golf is already a bigger deal. So therefore it's an easier selling point of, we want to put a championship disc golf course here. We want to dedicate resources to it with the hopes of, you know, a pro tour event coming. I think that's an easier sell, which then allows more resources to be dedicated, more people to get behind it and make disc golf almost like their life. Whereas in the U S there's a lot of other things that rank in priority. Crow Cole, for instance, is on the old nine of a golf course. And the other nine is still a golf course. I found out and they share a pro shop in the middle. Like, that's awesome, but that also explains a lot as to why the land looks the way the land does. And that wouldn't necessarily happen in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So kind of citing the priority of the sport there, I've always kind of considered that a factor in Europe for sure. Um, Mike, what are you thinking about this? Yeah, I, I found this also kind of a hard question to answer. At first, looking into it, I thought with Euro countries, there may be some government incentives for wellness, for stuff like that. And I thought that that might have something to do with it. I did reach out to some people at Crew Cole, some higher ups, and they confirmed they actually have never had government assistance, never will. It's all privately funded. All the maintenance and cost has been crowdfunded or from tournaments and events that they have. So that kind of took that idea away. I think at the end of the day, Euros have always kind of embraced niche sports and they care less about our NFL, NBA, MLB. So it's kind of like Hunter said, easier to penetrate those markets a little bit. I also think that for whatever reason here in the United States, we're still in the small communities and as a large, we're still battling kind of the negative stereotypes that come along with disc golf where with in Europe, I don't know how or when this necessarily happened, but it's just, you think professionalism when you think of disc golf. So it's just an easier sell. I do want to point out though, that I think we may be falling a little victim to like small sample size to the sense that we're seeing for a month, three, four of the most amazing best courses in this entire continent. And if we'll get to it later, but if we had to all of a sudden have 20 to 25 of these courses, I do kind of feel like the, the separation from us and them would be a bit smaller than we're kind of acting it is right now. But as stated, I do think those are kind of the major factors. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's definitely a valid point. You know, we, we do get, I mean, a larger dose of it these days, but still, uh, uh, you know, a select few courses. Um, Ross, what are you thinking about the Crow Cole open? Um, why do you think they're having such success with that course there? I think, uh, what was mentioned about uh, the embracement, the embracing of niche sports, um, over in Europe, they're just fanatical love for disc golf. And it's clear that they have a lot of volunteers and, and resources going to those courses which is amazing but i also think we have courses on tour that with the right um, investment can be at the same level as crocal i mean glendevere is a beautiful property milo is a beautiful property um the deglo toboggan if that court i think that course is amazing to watch green mountain championships maple hill i think there's a lot of stops on tour that if the right investments were made can be at that level of crocal you know where the tour is just spread out over so, over so many events um sponsorship dollars is, is limited um so the, you know it's kind of spreading out a, a limited number of money and you know there's also just some really bad courses on tour in my opinion from a, a purely visual perspective not talking about how they play how the the tournament shapes out just watching it you know, through my phone, through the TV, Victoria is not the prettiest place. I think the Texas swing in general, those courses don't present very well as like a visual product. Um, Idlewild, those turf greens just drive me up a wall. It's like, what are we doing here? Um, so I think there's, you know, maybe some fat that can be trimmed on the U.S. tour and embracing the properties um, that we do have that are uh, of that quality. Yeah, you definitely get a, a wide variety on the U.S. tour. That's that's for sure. And some of them are not as pretty to look at, even if they do maybe play effectively. Uh, Brody, wrap it up for us. Why do you think the Crow Cole is as nice as it is? How are they accomplishing this over there? Well, first thing is we need to figure out what this number one thing in the world is. Um, I think the way that they currently have it set up is terrible. Are they, they're literally just going off of the people that have played the course. 
Is that literally I mean, just, is it you uh, just, you, you just, just kind of decides, I think, I don't know what their process is. So how many people do you think that have played that course have also played courses in the United States? Um, not a huge so, percentage. So, so it'd be probably pretty hard to tell like what courses are good and not if you're literally only playing. All I'm saying is until we have like a system where people are playing all the top <laughs> courses and then ranking them, the number one system kind of is, I don't know. That's kind of a weird thing. Um, firstly, population, obviously in certain areas over there, the population isn't crazy. So they're going to be able to have potentially more land uh, usage. I mean, all the land that we have over here for disc golf is pretty much like floodplain. Uh, like no one wants it. They can't build on it. They can't do anything. Also, they might just have better land. Have you ever been over to Europe? There's a lot of places over there that are absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's kind of similar to like you asking, why are all the courses in, in Florida better? Well, they, a lot of them are near the beaches and they just have nicer uh, landscapes around them. A uh, couple of rebuttals here. So this might go a little bit over time, but first one to Hunter. Uh, I think I think this is a, a miss. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Misconception of where everyone over in Europe thinks disc golf is awesome. I, I don't think that's actually the case. There's also a lot of people that don't know what disc golf is in Europe. Also, I was shocked because everyone told me it's massive. It's massive. It's huge. I went to the sporting goods store, which is a massive, it's like Ikea over there. I walked around the whole thing trying to figure out like, where's this, where's the big room of all the disc golf stuff they literally just had a little panel of disc golf in this massive, massive sporting goods store. Second rebuttal too. I think this was from, was this from raw or Mike um, niche sports in Europe? Uh, you kind of were saying like they like niche sports. Soccer is the biggest sport in the world. Soccer is actually bigger over in Europe than the four biggest sports in the United States. They care more about their sports over there. Like you can, you a whole town will shut down if there's a match, a soccer match. So this idea that that's the reason is just to us, it makes it seem like disc golf is super huge. It's just because our sports that we like, they don't, they're not really popular over there, but soccer's crazy popper popular cricket's probably more popular in every sport in the United States over there. Field hockey's massive. Tennis is massive over there. Volleyball is massive. The tour de France actually just shuts down a huge portion of Europe while that's running. So even though football is not as big over there as it is here and basketball is not as big, they still have crazy massive sports that are far above disc golf. Um, but I think that's just a misconception a lot of people have. They just think like disc golf is a massive sport over there. Um, and there's still a lot of room to grow. I don't, yeah, I don't I think made, <clears throat> I made my point while your headphones were off. So I think you missed the first part and caught the second. Oh. My logic was the percentage of population compared to the percentage of population here is bigger, even though the number of people's less. So the percentage of population that knows what disc golf is, oh, is you're probably bigger right, over there. Yeah, I'm yeah, not saying it's right. the biggest sport of all time. I'm just saying percentage. If I walk down and ask 10 people, I'm more likely to have more people in Finland know what disc golf is than in the U S yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think right. honestly, when it comes to niche sports in Europe, the way I read it, it's not, it's not about a numbers thing. It's not about who's playing the sport more. It's about the way they interpret the niche sport. They seem to take every These niche, niche sport. sports though. That's what? the thing. They're niche sports to us because they're not popular here, but to them, they're not. I'm, niche I'm talking about disc golf right now. I'm saying, and like, hobby let, let's let me take a, let me take a sport like, um, uh, paddle, right? The Darts. one where they play tennis, like in the in the or, or yeah. There's there's a lot of sports that they when they embrace them in Europe, it seems like they take them to the highest level of professionalism they can right away. And a lot of that's because now, to be fair, like disc golf had a grassroots start in California that was the sport was never even meant to be like a professional sport. It, it really was like a hobbyist thing at the beginning. And then there were local tournaments, but you know, it was kind of a hippie type sport. It's just how it, it, it evolved. But when it, when you see it in Europe, the way they grabbed onto disc golf and embraced it, it seemed like right away, they wanted to make it as professional as it could be. And I, I feel like that's, that's where the vibe I get, but also you're right. I have, you know, I haven't been there and been immersed in that. I will say this though, to your point about the UDIS things, I know the ranking system's not perfect, but I don't need to go step foot on Crow Cole to see that it is way better than 99% of courses I've ever seen in the U S that's, that's just pretty obvious to me. I mean, it's, it looks like a masterpiece. Um, I, my yeah. whole thing is, it's like you, you, if we really want a good, like top 10 courses in the world, you got to have people 
voting that have played all those courses. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't even know. You I don't even know. You can't what? just say, "Oh, Maple Hill is the the number one course in the world." And I don't you've know. Never even played it because you just watched it. That, that yeah, you I don't know what their the I don't know what their system is. Well, I can I'm, tell you with certainty that the way they determine these is just simply when you go on U Disc and you yeah, finish a round, it's just a review. So. If you step guy, in dog poop on the number one course <laughs> in the world, you're going to give it a two star. So a guy who's never played on tour just showed up and plays one round somewhere. Cause I can tell you right now, there's some courses around me that are four and five stars that it's just cause people are happy to be there. And if you compare sure. them to a regular course, it's probably like a two star. Yeah. There's people are starting to take, take down snub. Dash's track. Wow. We were pushing for a five star. Now, now there's almost a battle against it of where people are voting it down just to try to take away the five stars. Well, that's unjust. I would that's never. That's not so, right. We need yeah, to restart not, the, the push yeah. to five stars. We get the five movement star going for again. Dash's track. Come yeah, on, if guys. You're, if you're listening right now, go go get the five stars on uh, Dash's track. Well, we're going to keep talking about Crow Cole because um, I want to take, let's take this point to the, the next extreme here and my next crazy idea. Um, so if you agree that products like the Crow Cole course are top notch and present disc golf in a more premium way, are we selling our sport short by touring the U.S.? Should disc golf as a professional sport relocate to Europe for the majority of the year? What are the cons, and could they be solved? Um, obviously an extreme idea. What are your thoughts, Mike? Well, I'm going to jump back to one of the points I made where if we just decided to do this and all of a sudden we have 25 events in Europe, I just really feel like that gap between what we experience now in the United States probably wouldn't be as much as we're acting like. Because when you have to get 25 really nice-looking courses that – pros actually will have difficulty on they may end up not being as many as we think another big thing that people always point to is the crowds and i think a lot of this is just bad decision making by the disc golf pro tour i mean i looked and to go to all four days of the great lakes at 75 dollars green mountains 50 uscgc is 80 worlds is 120 for european open zero dollars you can go all four days for free you want to pay a whopping 15 pounds, you get VIP access to four of the holes that you don't normally get to. But all the crowds we're seeing at the European Open, they're there for free. And so that is one step in making it look more professional, making it sometimes you can trick people into something being more popular than it is. And that's a good start. I think it wouldn't be a great idea, especially short term. Majority of the best players are American and a lot of them would not be able to afford to go. So already we'd be cutting short the, the pool. Most disc golf pro tour subs are in the United States and a lot of them aren't going to want to be getting up in the morning. And so there'll be a lot of unsubscribes for that. So financially it wouldn't make a ton of sense in a perfect world. The disc golf pro tour would just look at the European events and try to emulate and try to make some small changes. Um, but overall as a tour itself, unless it slowly rolled out, it would, would not go well. Okay. Fair enough. Ross, what are you thinking? I'm going to expand on this question a, a bit. I think the, the tour is, there's too many stops on the tour. Uh, currently, there's 22 uh, regular tour events, four majors, and then the championship. You know, one thing that makes football so amazing, totally different sport, but it's the fact that there's so few games. Each game is so important. I mean, the fact that right now, um, you know, ABS four wins, Gannon S3, like each win feels a little, the deeper you get into the season, each win feels a little less valuable. Um, so perhaps shortening the tour to 15 events, having four in Europe, three DGPT events, and then the one major, and then 11 events um, in the, in North America, whether those are all in the United States, maybe throw in a little Canada. That way, going back to the previous question, sponsors, the tour itself can invest in these properties, make these properties the highest quality possible. So that way they can turn to a, a a um, major sports broadcasting network and say, this is the best we have. Are you interested? Opposed to, you know, dynamic, basically paying CBS to broadcast something. Um, we should be trying to make the quality of the product good enough that it stands on its own. And I think by truncating the tour, um, you know, it could free up resources to do that. And there's just courses in Europe that are sick. And honestly, I like watching it in the morning. Maybe it's because I'm an East Coast guy. So when I wake up, it's like 9 a.m. and disc golf's on. I like that. Hey, yeah. Sometimes it pays to be on the East Coast time zone. Um, uh, yeah, the morning times it is a little weird uh, for FPO, though. Certainly, I, I can get that point. But yeah, I've heard. I've definitely heard more people talking about the idea of you know, what if the tour was shorter? Um, you know, could we get a better selection? Brody, what do you think? So without having like really the numbers here, it, it, it is difficult to really get a gauge. I I did say like 
if the European side, like you were saying, Trevor, earlier, if they're going to take it more professionally, if the fans are going to get behind it more, if it's, it's an easier operation, then maybe the tour should look to kind of almost flip-flop to where we have most of our events over there and then only a handful of events over here. Um, the only numbers that I can that are public to me to look at right now is just the live numbers from round one. And it's actually kind of surprising here. You look at OTB. OTB had 60,000 viewers. You go to Portland Open. Portland, and uh, this is just for MPO. Portland Open had 55,000 viewers. Uh, so it's clear that some people just don't like Portland Open that much because I would think as an elite plus event and the marketing and all that, like more people would be paying attention to that. But I think a lot of it has to do more with the course than anything else. Then you go to Beaver State Fling, 67%. Now I'm going to skip Turku because Turku, the field wasn't there. So I think that's first and foremost. The field's the most important because Turku, 44,000, huge drop-off. But then you go to these last two. You go to the Swedish Open. Not that many people there, but Paul McBeth there and a couple others, 79,000. And now the last one, sixty or 68,000 at Des Moines, and then 86,000 here. Mm. So those are the only numbers I can go off of. And if the numbers don't lie, we kind of got to follow them. That's those. Those are some interesting numbers right there. <laughs> those are some very interesting numbers. Hunter, what do you think about that? Uh, Brody's numbers are wrong is what I think about that because what he's <laughs> neglecting is that in the move to Europe, you're removing you're Jomez. Wrong. You're removing Jomez and you're placing it with MDG Media. And if you look at the post-production coverage numbers there, completely different story. So what it is is fans don't know where to go to watch the coverage and therefore they're watching it where they can. DGPT, that's why the numbers are inflated there because... Here's what I think about the whole matter. European disc golf is insane. It's awesome, right? The courses are phenomenal. I think that the thought process of if we were seeing 20 courses over there, would it be as phenomenal? A really good thought process. Probably not. Another thing we're missing. If we went over there 25 times, would the crowds be as big? I don't know. Think of it if you flipped it in the U.S. If there was only one event within driving distance of Charlotte, Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, Kentucky, all of that, there's only one now. What are the crowds going to look like there? I mean, the crowds at USDGC are like 5,000 people a day. They're wild, and that's people paying to go. When they also have the Tour Championship there, they have Idlewild within driving distance. They had Champions Cup within driving distance. This year, they had Florida's within driving distance. We have so many tournaments within driving distance that we're cannibalizing our own market. At the end of the day, the Pro Tour has to go where the people are. And where the most disc golfers are, number-wise, not percentage-wise, is the U.S. So you have to cater to that market because that's where the most eyeballs are. So you have to cater live coverage to not have FPO starting at like 4 a.m. You have to cater to all of that. And then you can expand to Europe here and there. I think the sport started here. There's more players here. Therefore, the tour has to be here, and we'll figure the courses out. Yeah, fair enough. Um Quite a slam dunk there. Uh, the my 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 mind always goes to the place you know when I watch these events in Europe and and obviously yes there's of course the bias that we don't play this huge selection of courses in Europe although frankly everyone we do see and we see quite a lot does look pretty awesome at this point but when you see a course like Crocol it feels like you're peering into the future sometimes and you're seeing a version of disc golf that you just don't really see ever and you're wondering you know why can't we be at this point everywhere you know why can't all the courses look like this and you know it's a pipe dream but ultimately obviously the biggest difficulty would do just i have rebuttal the- here or no you may always okay uh, do are we are we struggling with geography first off uh hunter's point made no sense everyone knows that the first round is free on disc golf pro tour mm-hmm. so this idea that they're got but more how do you viewers- watch the first round post-produced after where do i go because this is the numbers, Brody. Des Moines Championship, final round, front nine, 140,000 viewers post-produced. Crocole Open, final round, front nine, 60,000. There you have it. Well, that's because it's on two different platforms. You can't. I'm judging something that's all on one platform. You're yeah, going from Jomez that has way more subscribers. Those Jomez than, viewers have don't know where to go. They don't know to go to MDG, so they go to the For Pro round Tour. two or for round one? Jomez viewers. They don't have Crocol opens not on Correct. Jomez. So I have nowhere watching, to go. So they're watching live. They watch. That's their only option. They don't know MDG exists. Because okay. if I'm just watching Jomez, why would Jomez push MDG? That doesn't okay. make sense. 
So that's sure. my argument. It's also such a simple solution there. that you could just have Jomez doing it, doing the coverage. Also, There's no also, I don't know. I don't know why MDG their coverage is phenomenal. Why isn't that just published under Jomez? That makes no sense to me. Curious. That, that is a good point. Also, the other thing too is I think of all of us are kind of forgetting third grade geography here, and we're just assuming like if we have more events over in Europe, uh, they just can't withstand because it's so tight. Europe's big. Literally do a Google search and do Europe on top of the United States. Well, let's be clear. When and we say you, Europe, we're talking about Scandinavia because that's where no, all these I'm, forces are. I'm saying, I'm saying Europe as a whole, what, right? Why if, can't if, we have a cool event in Spain? Why could, can't we have but a cool I'm saying like the courses, that I'm, the courses that we're seeing to like reinforce my opinion right now are the ones we're seeing in Norway, Sweden, Finland. My argument so is if you live in Europe and you want to watch professional disc golf, you only have five options to watch the best players in the world. If you live in the U.S. and you want to watch professional disc golf, you have 20 options. So, of course, the crowds are going to be bigger. We have four yeah. times more options. Fair point. It's a fair point. At the end of the day, it comes down to this idea, too. Um, I just don't think I, people are going to travel that far for disc golf. You make it seem like people are going to travel six hours to go watch a disc golf tournament. They're I have not. multiple times in my life. You're that doesn't mean the majority are though, Hunter. Well, like if I'm a disc if there's golf 20 fan, of you, wow, you got 20 people to if show I'm up a disc at golf event. Good fan job. in the north of Finland, right? And there's an event in the south of Finland, and that's my only chance in a full calendar year is to drive six hours to watch the best players. There's in the a world. lot of people that there's are a lot going of people to do that. that are going to do that. The majority of the majority of people are not going to drive six hours to watch a disc golf tournament. The majority Hunter. of people are not going to watch a disc golf event. No, I'm saying the majority of people that would, if you put that same tournament in that city that would show up and then you pulled those people and said, hey, this tournament's no longer going to be in that city. It's going to be six hours south. The majority of those people that would have showed up at that tournament aren't driving six hours to go watch disc golf. You're crazy. More than you would think. You're going to put a census no. out there is the only way to decide. We have to pull the people. Uh, in the comments down you, below, you've made this argument Finland, multiple would times. You drive to the south of Finland. You made this Comment argument multiple below. times, and it's a terrible argument just because it's like you would. Most people wouldn't do that. Who knows? <laughs> I can only see what I see. Tough to say, man. Tough to say. It Brody, isn't, if, if it was below 40 degrees, Brody wouldn't travel. I drove, so. I drove from here to Kansas to watch Worlds. That's like 14 hours, middle of nowhere. Yeah, you also work in disc golf. That was, like that it's was your, 2017. It's, but I'm saying that like, that's you're not you're not the typical person that I mean most people are going to look and say like what we were talking about earlier most people are going to look and be like oh tickets are ten dollars I'm not going to that like that's the type the, of people we're dealing with the one thing you have to think of though is for how much disc is it going to cost fans, to drive six hours get a hotel you'll agree with this statement come on a guys. lot of disc golf fans that are diehard disc golf fans this is our sport. Right, like we aren't diehard NFL fans, diehard NBA fans. Sure, whatever. sure. So, would you, when you factor into that, is it a crazy statement for me to drive five hours to watch a Washington Wizards? Game? Yes, yes, because a lot of people look at that and say, "Do I want to spend two hundred and fifty dollars to go watch disc golf, or do I want to use that two hundred and fifty dollars on a new bag? Do I want to use that two hundred and fifty dollars on ten new discs?" Those are those are the options people are actually weighing. And That's most you, people yeah, are going I mean, to pick the, the disc. The most expensive tournament he mentioned was Worlds at 120. But you're driving six hours, Hunter. You're getting a yeah. hotel. You're paying for gas. It's not cheap. It's not. You don't just tell. I'm just saying. To a it doesn't. It doesn't sound crazy. Away. It wouldn't sound crazy if I flew to Dallas to watch a Dallas Cowboys game. I think the other thing we're not it talking about be. here is like we're not trying to fill a NFL stadium. Like visually, when we look at these events, there's a big difference between 150 people that show up at an event. To a thousand people like it's not yeah. that many more people and so Certainly. if 10 people that are two hours away go and five people three like those add up and like for me i'm the closest one for me is four hours and i will go to that one but if there was one only six what hours away i'd go to that one too if that was my only option and so i when we're talking about these small fields or crowds to begin with you don't really have to push the needle that much to make these look bigger than Wait, what oh. tournament are you going to? That's four hours away. Uh, preserve. Oh, what do you think? Of, what do you think of it? Uh, I mean, fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody gets I, real cagey I, about I've, preserve these days. I played. I played the course. And did you go all three days? I didn't go this year. I went last year. But my point stands. 
Yeah, he did go. <laughs> no, your point <laughs> doesn't <laughs> stand. You if, literally if it just said. Me up, if you it was literally just said it was only one tournament four <laughs> hours away. You made that trip and you said, I'm never doing that again. No, I never said I'd never do it. I never said I'd never do it again. My point is I for these people. And the I other thing too case. is like these other people, like again, as we pointed out, they only have three events they get to choose from. So it's true, if, man. And and I'm I'm obviously in the Midwest in the middle of nowhere, so it's a little different for me. But for people who are only an hour away, and now if it's three hours away, if it's their only option, they're gonna go. Embrace debate. I, I will say last year for Worlds in Vermont, uh, you know, went up with some some homies from Connecticut. It's like five hour drive from me, about a four hour drive from them. People who play disc golf. Basically, the only way we were able to do this trip was bribing them with doing non disc golf things in Vermont. Well, you know, I, here's think, what I'll I think say. the casual disc golf fan just does not want to commit to that much travel. That much. It's a full day. Like, it's a big commitment. And, you know, there are people like people, us that, that will here's do the that. Only thing I wanna, people in Dallas don't want to go to the Dallas Cowboys game I, and have I just to deal wanna, with the hour, hour traffic before and after the game. Well, they're spoiled. I, I just want to speak to the fandom of disc golf. And this is the only thing I want to say about this. And we're, we're done talking about it. There is probably at least two to three groups of people per week that roll into the store here in Lynchburg, just a Frisbee store, not a pro tour event, a Frisbee store, and tell us that they drove at four plus hours, sometimes 12 hours to come to our Frisbee store. Yeah, because you're a celebrity, Trevor, okay? The pro tour yeah, is full dog. of them, Brody. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're saying. Trevor can't even go to You're ice cream store. You're bigger than the Pro Tour, Trevor. Okay, there you no, have it. I'm Trevor can't that... even go to an ice cream store and win. <laughs> yeah, no. Literally, every That's time he goes to an point. ice cream store, the someone point knows is, who if, you are. If people treat our Frisbee store that way, I'm not shocked to think that people would treat the Pro Tour at a much higher level. They're willing to travel. Disc golf fans, they, we take this sport seriously, man. Gosh dang it. If I, <laughs> Anyways, all right, next one. Uh, last topic, a lot simpler, a lot more mellow. Um, we're going to talk about the European Open coming up. So I just want to know, as we head into the European Open, give me your favorites for MPO and FPO and why. And then also just give me one player, MPO or FPO, that could fly under the radar and snag this tournament, kind of your dark horse pick, if you will. Ross, what do you think? Uh, so for FPO, I think there's only one answer. It's Kristen. When I pulled up the tournament last year, I had to refresh my browser three times to make sure that I read it correctly, that she won this event by 16 strokes with Evelina and uh, in the field. I don't think she's going to win by that much with, with Missy and other folks there, but I think she's a, a shoe in, especially after her coming back and getting confidence at Krokel. Uh For MPO, I'm looking now for Isaac Robinson. I think this, these, these courses, he can keep it in play, keep it in bounds, keep the disc in play. Um, his biggest issue, it seems like this year, is that putter. You know, he was nasty from 40 to 50 feet when he was on. Um, if he can find that putter, I think he's uh, someone to look for uh, this weekend. Maybe I'm also rooting for him to get the career grand slams. So maybe I'm a little biased on that front. Um, someone that can fly under the radar, I think two-time major champion Chris Dickerson. Um, when I was looking into last year's event, I was shocked to see um, that he came in eighth, only seven strokes off the lead. Guy who had never gone on a plane before, shows up in Europe, comes in eighth after shooting a two under um, thousand rated first round. So he's someone I think that if he's feeling himself, he gets off to a good start. Um, maybe somebody who can uh, pull this off. And then Paige Pierce, you know. I was thinking about throwing Layson in some puns, but I'm going to leave those on, on the uh, cutting room floor. I think she's got a lot of motivation, a lot of fire to try to take down um, their Ty Kenny. Um, I think every major, just like Paul, she's someone to look out for. Hey, Kristen may have won by 16, but Paige is in the field. So you never know. You never know what's going to happen out there. Good picks. I, I hope Isaac can, can get it done. That would be, that'd be great. Wait, what'd you just say, Trevor? What? Would you, what was the last thing you just said? Something about Paige being in the field? You said, da 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 da, Paige is in the field? I Something about you better watch out, I guess. I don't know. He said Kristen won by 16 last year, but this year, Paige is in the field. Oh. She wasn't there last year. Oh, she, oh, and she wasn't at this tournament that Kristen just won either, right? I was saying it sarcastically. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Anywho. Brody. Uh, okay, Golly. well, that was that was a Ross dress for less answer if I've ever heard one there. Um, <laughs> the first, I, the only one that I think I agree with you on is Chris Dittar. I think if anyone says that she's not the favorite coming into this, 
uh, the, they actually don't watch FPO. Um, uh, for me, I, I like Gannon Burr here. Uh, he has yet to win, obviously, this tournament. Uh, you know, you can look at his finishing place and be like, ah, he wasn't really in it. Uh, he took a kind of a stupid double bogey there on hole 18. I, I think he is playing the best disc golf right now uh, over the last course of the month. And I think we'll see how the other course sets up. I heard that distance is going to be required a little bit more over there. So that should be interesting, but I got Gannon Burr now for my dark horse picks here. I'm going to go with someone that no one's really talking about. And it's mostly because he hasn't had the greatest season uh, in the last month or so the last couple of weeks, he hasn't been playing too great, but that's Ezra Aderholt. Uh, this is a guy that finished third at the European Open. This is a tournament that he likes a lot. He likes being over in Europe. He likes the feed. He likes the uh, feel and food. I think I just molded those two words. Um, but without hole th- uh, three last year and hole 11, he could have won that tournament in the final round. He kind of blundered yeah. it away there on those two holes. Uh, so I, I look for him, and um, you're looking at FPO. The answer is simply this. There is no one. There is no dark horse pick because right now, Christy, Missy, Evelina, Hannah, Silva, Cage. Did I say Christy? Christy Tatar. Cage and Anakin. Uh, If anyone outside of that group that I just listed wins, I will give away an OG Get Freaky to a listener right here. Okay. Wow. You said it. All right. How about a PS5? Give away a PS5. Yeah, me. <laughs> oh, it's I don't have a PS5. Ah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of the spirit of the giveaway. Um, oh, I all buy right. one and then give it away. That's Hunter, let's much. hear your picks. That's too much. That's I, cool. you know, this, I thought this was going to go a different route, but you, let me, I'll start with FPO because I think everyone's overlooking the course change, right? We have added in a wooded track. So where Kristen won by 16 last year, we are bringing in an additional course. Missy Gannon has been having one heck of a season, right? With the addition of the wooded course, I think she has a chance to cut Kristen's win deficit to maybe 13 uh, at the end of the day. So Kristen, by a mile still, don't think that's going to matter. On MPO's side, um, I was really expecting more people to pick Anthony Barella considering the bunker rule got blown up. And without that, the dude probably won. I'm still not going to pick him because Kyle Klein is just kind of sneaking under everyone's radar as he does. Came in second here last year. I like him at this course, obviously. And you also got to like him at the new course because no one else has really seen it. So I think Kyle Klein is going to be my my pick to win. Um, and my dark horse pick, if you will, for MPO, I'm going with Ezra Robinson. Okay, mm-hmm. Isaac Robinson has been having the best season. Ezra Robinson, his brother, has been having a really good season. They tied last year in 12th place. And if you look, we're adding a long, tight technical course overall. That's what I've read about it. Haven't seen it played yet, but it seems like the tight, the woods are very tight. So I think a technical player like Ezra Robinson could do really well. He came in third at champions cup. It feels like we're adding in a Northwoods black to the mix. So a player who was up there, it's having a good season and is good in the woods. I think it really be a player to watch out for throwing out Northwoods black comparisons. Chucking I haven't seen the course. Might not be anything like <laughs> just, it. Just I read. I just read on their website, tight technical long, and I was like, "Ah, oh, Northwoods." <laughs> it's good. I'm gonna die if that course plays like anything but Northwoods. <laughs> um, it's just wide open. All right, Mike, who you got? What are your picks? I was kind of chuckling when Brody went because his my notes were eerily similar to everything he said. He probably stole. Them. I've before, heard that before. I found out there was a long wooded course added. Gannon's not played any of these courses before. He's never played the European Open. I don't feel good about that one. And I had Ezra down as well until I found out that there was a wooded court. So scratch both of them. My MPO is Nicholas Antela. He's playing really well lately. He's only missed top 10 once since May. Um, I would normally pick, like, you know, the people you always pick, Ricky, Calvin. You already know how I feel about them when he majors, so scratch them. Um, they added that new wooded course. No one's really played it. From what I've heard, the Europeans, especially the ones who have been around, longer recently all have had chances to play it so they'll have more an advantage on those um as far as fpo it's Kristen. i'm not gonna waste any time everyone hates ratings on this podcast i think but she's 17 rating points higher than everyone else she just took two months off and won relatively easily in that last round she won last year by 16 strokes owen and holland's not going to be there she's winning by how much 
far as sneaky picks go, uh, kind of the same reason as Nikola. I'm going with Vino for sneaky. Been in Europe for the past month, has plenty of time to do these courses if he has been. Done pretty well historically at this tournament, and he's played really well the last two events, so I'm going there for sneaky. And then for FPO, I mean, literally anyone on this other than Christian could count, in my opinion. Anyone can fly under the radar because she's going to. But uh, I'll go with Heidi uh, Line. Uh, she hasn't finished worse than seventh at the European Open in three times. I think she has a pretty good chance, maybe not winning, but at least finishing. A lot of confidence in Kristen Sitar on this podcast. I mean, not that that's anything different than normal, but it'd be a shame. You know, it would be a shame. It would be a darn shame if Kristen went out there and lost. Um, no, I mean, she's the favorite, though. We can't. We, no, it, absolutely. I'm not, yeah. I'm not guaranteeing a win. Well, I, I'm, I'm guaranteeing I'm a win. Oh, <laughs> all right. I would Mike never guarantee. guarantee a win. Like, give away PS5. She doesn't win, Mike. Me, <laughs> daughter. Daughter, he's chomping at it right Please. now. <laughs> all right, uh, we're gonna move on to our final uh, topic. Everybody's gonna stay on the screen though, so <laughs> because we don't have a producer tonight, so it'll be a new one. Um, you just got to stay around and listen. Um, also. The we usually switch to a two minute clock. Obviously, we don't have that, so I will keep the first thirty seconds, and then you'll see your clock start. So, just incredible improvisation. That was a butchering of that word, and um, we'll get going. So, you guys are tied right now, Mike. You're the newcomer, so I'll let you decide if you want to go first or second. Second. Okay, gonna go second. He wants the hammer, Hunter. You will go first with our final topic. So. Here we go. If disc golf had a hall of fame that actually mattered and people paid attention to which players that are currently active would be first ballot hall of famers, you know, quote first ballot hall of famers in your mind, use other sports reference if you need help, but yeah, what are your, who would be your first ballot people right now? Um, what do you think Hunter? Uh, well, first off, I don't, I don't know how I like this question, the wording of it, because our hall of fame obviously does matter like we have the hall of fame it exists what is there going to be a new hall of fame that starts like what why and like how would that make sense because then what do you do with everyone who's on the hall of fame that deserves to be on the hall of fame i think the hall of fame is fine as it is people just don't pay attention to it because the sport's so young and most of the people who are going to be hall of famers with big names are playing right now which is where this question comes in but that's similar to every other sport that's ever existed when the hall of fame first started you're putting in people that only people in the know know. Um, with that being said, first thing that comes to mind, right? Active player, first ballot Hall of Famer, got to be Paul McBeth. I believe he was already on a ballot. I believe he's not a first ballot Hall of Famer. Ball dropped. Um, so I'm still going to use him as one of my answers because like he deserved it, but that time's come and gone. With that being said, I think another player you got to – he say is going to be a first ballot hall of famer is Ricky Wysocki. He's poised to this month cross Paul for the all time earner in disc golf. He should, by the end of July, if things keep trending the way they do, he'll be the number one earner of all time. So I think Ricky Wysocki as it currently sits, and then I'm going to spin it a little bit and go with players that I think also Kristen Tatar FPO has to be Paige Pierce FPO has to be, um, I'm also going to spin it and say players that I think by the end of their career, they're currently active by the end of their career will be first ballot hall of famers. Um, Gannon Burr, I think will be. Um, and the only other one that I'm pretty confident is Anthony Barella. I, I do think mm. that he's going to get more consistent and figure it out. I think that his arm talent is good enough. Um, Eagle McMahon, had he not had this injury would have been a no brainer for me, but with the injury, there's too much question around like, will he be able to get back? And he doesn't have the resume as of right now, in my opinion, to be on that list. So Paul Macbeth squandered, but he still earns it. In my opinion, Ricky Wysocki, Paige Pierce, Kristen Tatar, Gannon Burr, Anthony Barella. Some early calls there. Early yeah, really calls. early. But really I like early calls for first bout Hall of Famer from Hunter there. Gannon's um, already got okay. a major. He's like 18. I like him. Here's all I want to say to that. Um, you said, you know, obviously, yes, we do have a Hall of Fame, and you seem to really stand up for it, but then also mentioned in your argument, A, active players can be voted on. That's stupid. And B, our, the greatest player we've ever had in the history of our sport wasn't first ballot. So I think well, that's said, probably... You, you worded it as actually mattered, and I just feel yeah. like if I'm on the Hall of Fame... Like that is a slap in my face. That's a bummer. I'm not saying they wouldn't be. I'm not saying those people that are in the Hall of Fame shouldn't be there, but we don't talk about Hall of Fame in the sport ever until now. <laughs> I think relevant players haven't been added because they're still playing right now. Well, Paul was up and then and didn't get in. 
But okay, anyways, Mike, well, the whole I'll reason Mike... he didn't get in is because let, people were let like, me argue with him, Trevor. People yeah. were saying the, the their logic was an active player shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. But they let Klima in while he was active. Well, That's let's the... define active. That's the other. I quality. think it was during the height of his. I, I believe he was elected during the height of his career. But like the tour was barely even around. They didn't really have it. Now that we have a tour, I think is where things will start getting more interesting. Who's in the finals? Sense. Fair enough. I guess, I, I'll, I'll stop talking. I'll stop <laughs> talking. I'm just saying. I just, I just feel like this wording of, of Hall of Fame that actually mattered is very disrespectful to the players that are in that Hall of Fame. I do not care. Mike, go for it. All right. Lucky we get two minutes. I'm spending the first 30 seconds talking about how terrible our Hall of Fame is. It is trash. <laughs> but don't worry to the respect to the people in it. We'll let them all in. That's totally fine. They deserve to be in it. I'm sure all of them that are in it probably do deserve to be in it. We're not questioning that. But the fact that you just had to be 45 years or you had to be in disc golf for 15 years, that was the old that was the old way of getting in. Until Paul came along, they're like, well, we don't really want to put him in yet, so let's change the rule. In typical of the PDGA and disc golf, they like got it right, but they didn't quite read long enough on what they were trying to copy. They copied the, the Golf Hall of Fame, 45 years old or three years retired. So you're telling me that if Paul retires today, we have to wait 10 more years to put him in the Hall of Fame. Doesn't make any sense. So let's do 45 years or three ret years retired. That's totally fine. I went to their website to try to like get all the information. Words are cut off. Website's not complete. Like, come on, let's make a new one. Let's do it right. So everybody's grandfathered. As far as who we have in it, I have Ricky and Paul. No, no question, that's it. And then for FPO, we're gonna go Kristen, Paige. And I'm really shocked that Hunter left out Cat. Cat has to be first ballot. She has the exact same like body of work as Kristen does as far as majors. She has one more major, same amount of worlds. I didn't check Pro Tour wins because there's more than there used to be. But as far as majors and worlds, she has her outdone. You have to give her. And then I'm gonna give a little bonus because I checked some people who aren't in the old in the old one. I say old because Will Shoestrick, you gotta put him in first ballot, four-time major winner. You gotta give it to Dave Feldberg, seven-time major winner. In one world. Um, I think with FPO, you maybe need to lower the like tier. And also first ballot's kind of tricky too, because different sports do it different way. Like MLB, they let almost no one in on first ballot. And then like some other sports, if you deserve to get in, you kind of just get in. But I think for FPO, we have to lower the standard just a tiny bit with how much Christian Page and Kat have dominated. So I actually kind of want to put Sarah Holcomb in potentially. She has three majors. I didn't Ooh. know that. And one worlds. And then I have to give Jul Juliana Corver. She's already in the other one, but let's. I want to mention her too. Some good picks. Uh, yeah, you mentioned baseball. Um, the thing, the funny thing about baseball is the reason that people sometimes don't get well, almost never get in first ballot is because they have the writers putting in their votes, and there's certain writers that are just like, I will never let somebody in first ballot because of tradition. What are you doing? Uh, steroids. I'm shooting myself up. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, there are other, there are also people that are just never getting the Hall of Fame because of steroids, but that that's not why certain players didn't get it. Because the other, there were certain the players that issue, had one voter that didn't get them in. The other issue with our current uh, Hall of Fame, every other sport has, like, they might have some people in the Hall of Fame, but they always have and writers and experts and these outside entities. Ours mm -hmm. is just the people who are already in it. So we have this fraternity that, like, with Paul, well, I don't think he really deserves being yet. He's still young. He's still playing. So that's a big issue too. It yeah, has process, to be a has to be a different group of people. Process is up for debate. Um, my thing is, and like I mentioned, obviously, I wrote this question in a sense of I don't think the people that are in the Hall of Fame now are undeserving of that. Whatever that is, what it is. I just feel like, and and Hunter, your point of a lot of the players we'd care about getting in are, are playing right now. That's a fair point. That's absolutely a fair point. Totally agree with that. I don't feel like there's the framework set right now, as far as the way the hall of fame is treated and looked at for that. Even like, I feel like if right now, if the Paul Macbeth, if we were three years down the road and the hall of fame was what it was now, and Paul got into the hall of fame or whatever it was, um, I, I still don't think we would talk about it in the same regard as we talk about Hall of Famers in other sport. It's just not, I don't know. It just doesn't click in disc golf. That's, that's it's just time. It's a time thing. But it's also like you nobody talks about other it. People, that's our job. But in, I'm trying. I'm trying, man. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I my I rebuttal know to Kristen the Tarr, real, the, why okay. I chose Kristen over Katrina Allen isn't by body of work, but by influence in breaking the amount of cash she had in one year, breaking that, and the time frame that she did it all this in, which she's done it much faster in the career. Um, and also she hasn't had the falling off in her prime that Katrina Allen has had.
which I do think should taint your first ballot Hall of Fame. Uh, I mean, I I don't I just don't think Kat's in her prime anymore. Like it's not that her prime has been bad. Her prime's just over. And I think that when you look back when it was Paige and Kat battling and I mean, th- we're talking about the three best women disc golfers of all time. So to not put Kat in, it, you don't, it, again, I'll be all three. That's not on my top three. I'm, is it? I have Juliana yeah, is Corver, it? Des Redding, it? Paige Pierce. Is it? Kat okay. has more majors than Juliana in a harder field. Yep. It's crazy. It's crazy how, that, how like, I mean, that is a valid, that's valid point. It's also crazy how like own is somehow in her prime yet older than all these other people that we say right, that aren't in their that's prime. An, that's enough of this guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's just a ridiculous statement. People just throw how many times do time. I have to tell you that prime has nothing to do with age. It's when you're playing your best. You can be 50. You can be 80. When you are playing your best, you are in your prime. When you're no longer playing your best, you are no longer in your prime. That is all it means. Not really. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, <some laughs> That's what people, that is really some, what it means. Some people say that this is your pro. Like some people st- like forecast what your prime is going to be, and saying these are going to be your prime years. Yeah, people's people's that assumptions mean the people's years, assumptions would yes. Like if you're an NBA going off player, of phys- physically going off yes, phys- physically that your prime does often line up physically, but it does not always translate, especially Correct. especially in the sport of golf or disc golf where physical attributes are not nearly as important as how yeah. you're just throwing the disc. I would also like to point out to the Juliana Corver, Katrina Allen, Juliana was playing in an era where there was like one major a year. It's, that is a fair point. I mean, that how many majors point. would she, she also, has five world. One of you how many would the she question have? Correctly. And I'm not answer right. I gave well, a list you were, of my you were throwing on people saying like they they're going to be. I think they're going to be. Yeah. 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 yeah he's asking right now. Currently, A B would, would not A B would not be a first time right now. He would not get in. I just, and, then, said, current and then you pick someone that's be. not an I active player. AB you pick Will, Will Schuster. Well, I did Will say would be, not could be. You picked uh, Will Schuster because it's not an active player. And Dave I mean, Dave define Dave active. Dave. He played a tournament last year. <laughs> I just, that, that, that was my point I, of define the active. The way I looked at it, the way I looked at Will and Dave is because they're not in the old Hall of Fame. You can't forget about the fact them, that Dave so I wanted, is not I wanted to give him a bonus. I mean, come on, Hunter. You got to admit, that's crazy. I just think, like, the Hall of Fame could it use restructuring. Yeah, but we don't need a new Hall of Fame. Well, I, I think if you restructured I it, it, it would be I a new I knew I wasn't going to win the second it came after the question, but I just don't like the statement the Disc Golf Hall of Fame actually mattered. I don't like that. Fair enough. He's a defender. He's a defender of the yeah. old the old awesome. rank. <laughs> I think we could. Can we change stuff up? Absolutely. But saying the disc golf hall of fame doesn't matter is a wild all, statement. All I want to see is I can't. I'm wait didn't write the question. I, I didn't that. write the question. I can't so. wait until some. You didn't write the question. Some no, 70, it's fan submitted. Some seventy-five year old no, I'm just guy. Kidding, I wrote it. <laughs> I'm gonna wait for some seventy-five year old guy to walk up to Hunter at USDGC and be like, <laughs> Hunter, I'm a hall of famer. Come over here. And then Hunter, Hunter's going to walk away being like, gosh, I just got stuck talking to this guy for five minutes. That's exactly what you would do. That's <laughs> I don't, exactly, know, what, I don't you know, know what the point of that is. I don't know what that means. I've, I've Hunter's been, trying to say he, he's upset that the question awesome. was written that uh, – Hunter's just trying risk, to get into the Hall of Fame, let's be honest. No, Hunter's no. saying that he, he <laughs> the Hall of Fame should be respected. He doesn't like that the question was word the way it is. And I'm saying if some random guy that you've never heard of is in the Hall of Fame and wants to talk to you, you would not be like, oh, let me let me talk to you. Yes, let me give you my time. I'd you would not do that. I talked exactly. to Pete May for like 35 minutes at USDGC. You know who that is, though. Said. You know who that is. Disc Golf Hall of Famer, founder of College Disc Golf. <laughs> okay, I'm sure there's someone out there that's a Hall of Famer that you've never heard of. It's the same thing it's as every sport. It's the same as some AM40 guy that I says I guarantee you're world you there's champion. a Basketball Hall of Famer I've never heard of. That doesn't mean the Hall of Fame doesn't matter. No, but you would probably respect that basketball player more doesn't than some guys. Nobody said the Hall of Fame golfer. doesn't matter, man. You wrote the Hall of Fame doesn't <laughs> Nobody matter. Nobody said that, man. That's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, I'm, willing, anyways, I'm willing to fall on the sword and lose this one. My point stands here. I'm, my, I'm more I don't know than what happy. you guys are talking about. My point stands. Honestly, uh, listen, Hunter. Honestly, I don't have a problem with you coming after the question. Is it a little ambitious? Yes. I thought um, calling A.B. and Gannon first ballot Hall of Famer, That's that crazy. was a reach to me. That was a reach. Maybe not be. as much with Gannon because he's at least won a major. Well, at least they're active AB, players. That's that's a that's a little bit of a reach for me. That, Neither that's one of those guys would get in though right now. That is honestly. I read it as would be like future tense. Will even, they be fierce ballot Hall of Famers? Yeah, I, I I don't know. I thought it was a little bit of a reach. That's the only reason I cut you short. It had nothing to do oh, with okay. your I can opinion see. of the question. That's all okay. I was reading. It's like current okay. active you can players read the that question. Will be yes. first ballot Hall of Famers. That's true. That's okay. how I read it. I give it to you. 
Hand up, guys. That's you why can I didn't read the question two different Dave ways. Feldberg. It said currently yeah. active. That's hey, minus two points for the host. Minus two points for the host. I know. Hey, I know when to take the L. But you know who's not taking the L? It's Mike. Mike, you did a great job today. Congratulations. I can't give you the full screen because the mouse is so far away on Silas's desk. Um, I hope we're still recording for your first victory. Um, congratulations. What do you have to say? Well, I had something planned if I won, but I'm going to switch it. Be light on my feet. I'm going to shout out three people. I'm going to shout out Hunter for dying on his sword. That was very valiant of you to stand up for them. Thank you. I'm going <laughs> to shout out everybody in the Hall of Fame. We love you. We want you in our new one. Your old one just sucks. Name five <laughs> people. But we love you. Name Harry five Miller, people. Harry Miller, Ken Climo, Barry Schultz. Uh, wow, three. And um, also, I want to shout that out Silas. That's how far because... away the preserve is from your house. <laughs> I'm going to shout out <laughs> Silas because apparently he keeps this ticking all the time. So shout out Silas. And I think this might be down. a good time to uh, implement the winner comes back next week. Okay. Well, hey. I'd love to have you on back next week. Get on that sign-up sheet. If you're already there, you know, we'll have you on next week. How about it? Um, we'll see what you can do against the Gary monster. <laughs> see what you can see what you can do about that because that guy is hard to beat. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this show. Um, obviously a little bit chaotic without Silas here. Um, so we don't even have the QR code to pop up on the screen. You're just going to have to find it in the description if you want to submit any topics. Listen, last week, we didn't have a ton of topic submissions. That's why there was none in this one. I think we only have one or two. Um, Make sure to submit those topics. We love we loved getting your uh, input on what you want to see debated on the show. Click the link in the description to submit those through the Google form so we can talk about them on a future episode. Thanks again for watching. We will see you next week. And next week, we will actually transition into different scenes and so on and so forth and have a producer. So shout out Silas. Comment down below, Silas is the GOAT. Thank you very much. See you then.